I welcome you all to the fourth lecture of the course Psychology of Emotions Theory and Applications. So, this is overall fourth lecture and it is the first lecture of module 2. So, the module 2 is about culture and emotions. So, in this module we will be talking about there will be two lectures and uh, primarily we will be talking about the interaction between culture and emotions. How culture can influence or are there any universal emotions or there are some aspects of emotions which are culture specific. So, all these details we will be talking about in these two lectures. So, it is the first lecture of module 2 and overall it is the fourth lecture. Uh, so, both the universal and cultural differences aspects of emotion will be discussed in this module. So, before we talk about uh, today's lecture, let me give you a brief recap of what uh, we discussed in the last lecture, which was uh, first uh, the last lecture of module 1 also. So, in the last lecture we talked about the communication of emotion and the measurement of emotions. So, in the communication of emotion we have talked about that you know primarily there are uh, two channels of communication of emotion, one is verbal and another is non-verbal. So, in verbal generally we express whatever we want to say through the language. language. In the non-verbal part paralinguistic aspects also communicates, the communication through paralinguistic aspects and non-verbal channels are kind of looked at. So, communication of emotion or overall communication is not just about what you say, uh, but also depends on how you say, how, what is your body language, how you express it, what is the tone of saying something. So, all these things aspects com, you know, are important in the communication of emotion and the communication in overall also. So, in the last lecture we have discussed all these things in detail, particularly we discussed uh, non-verbal communication through facial expressions because emotion is very uh, you know significantly expressed through our face and the muscles of the face and we have discussed how you know emotions can be expressed through face and different researches associated with it. We also talked about uh, how emotion can be expressed through the body movements and the postures and so on. In that context also we have discussed the different empirical evidences associated with it. And at the end, we have discussed how emotion is expressed through the voice, uh, particularly the prosody part of it, where you no know, the pitch of the voice, rate of the voice, and intensity of the voice, and so on. How all these aspects also conveys emotion or the different emotions and uh, the empirical evidences associated with them. Uh, then we have discussed uh, in the last lecture also the, about the measurement of emotion. Uh, in that context, we have discussed that there are three primary, uh, you know. Uh, ways of measurement of emotion primarily adopted by the researcher. One is self-report measures which basically ask the participants to report their own subjective feelings through certain scale or Likert scale like rating scale like 1 to 10, 1 to 5 and so on. Uh, because subjective aspect of emotion no one else can detect it. So, it is the only the concerned person can report. So, it is that is why it is called as a self-report measure where the concerned person reports his or her subjective feelings in a scale. So, that you know it, it, it becomes measurable. Obviously, there are limitations to it uh, and uh, we have discussed all these limitations. Uh, then uh, uh, physiological measures are there where you know uh, because every emotion is associated with certain physiological changes in the body. So, some research tries to capture those changes as an aspect of measurement of emotion. Since these are always associated with emotions, measuring those physiological changes also gives us an idea of what happens when such emotions are experienced. So, it includes something like you know even measuring heartbeat, skin conductance, uh, sweating and so on. Uh, it also includes uh, you know measurement of brain waves, electrical signals in the brain using you know EEG, fMRI and so on, who have discussed all these things. So, these also have their own advantages and disadvantages. Then uh, uh, the third one is called behavioral measures, where you do not, uh, we just report uh, or kind of you know uh, try to measure observable actions associated with the um, emotions. So, it may include you know uh, measuring or reporting the body movement or facial expressions and so on specific softwares have also been developed like FSC by Paul Ekman and, and his group, which tries to measure different muscle movement and the you know changes in the muscle movement using 
uh, certain softwares. So, those are also used nowadays uh, to measure the behavioral aspects of emotions. So, all these uh, measures, all these methodologies has their own advantages and disadvantages depending on the situation, feasibility, people use all these measures and um, the best ways if possible, if combination of these measures are used to measure emotions that gives much more validity. So, these are the things that we have discussed in the last class. So, today we will be discussing about uh, in the context of culture and emotion. Uh, we will be talking um, primarily focusing on the universal part of it. Are there evidences of universal expression of emotion? We have discussed some of it, but now it more in, in depth way we will discuss here. So, are there universal emotions? Uh, are there universal expression of emotions in terms of facial expression, in terms of vocal expression, in terms of physiological aspects of emotions? Uh, then we will also discuss what component of emotion are, are universal. Is it like uh, some of the emotions are universal or some aspects or components of emotions are universal. So, we will be talking about Componential Theory of Emotion also in this context. So, let us start today's lecture. So, in the context of culture and emotion, because this module is about culture and emotion, uh, the major question that will be addressed here is that do people in different culture experience similar emotion? Is it like people in different cultures, they experience emotions very similarly or the experience of emotion or the expression of emotions are different as, as uh, the culture changes. Uh, so, that is a very significant question to understand because it has a lot of relevance in today's world where you know globalization is happening and there is an interaction uh, between all cultures. So, understanding experiences of emotion across culture is very significant in today's world particularly where we are no longer living in an isolated world. It is a world where you know, there is a constant interaction among peoples of different cultures. So, the study of culture and emotion addresses this very important question. Uh, this research area is particularly very significant and may have many practical and applied implications. Uh, it will have implications in cross cultural communications you know. Uh, which is uh, which is very important. So, uh, it will have uh, many implication in the cross cultural communication when people from different culture you know, interact in terms of communication, uh, this understanding will be very important. Uh, negotiations in business, counseling, organizational behavior, leadership and so on. Because now, in the context of organizations also peop, uh, employees are not just from one culture, you know, there can be people from multiple cultures. So, a leader has to understand the perspective of people from different cultures. So, in that, in that context cross cultural understanding of emotion will be very important to lead an organization to make it a productive and so on. Uh, things like counseling, you know business negotiation etcetera will have also a lot of implication in today's world in terms of cross cultural communication or cross culture understanding of emotions. So, we will uh, look into these aspects in more detail in today's lecture. So, throughout the history of if you see history of study of emotion particularly in the field of psychology and some associated disciplines, uh, the pendulum has constantly swung between you know uh, it was kind of two broad paradigms, two broad approaches of uh, how emotions should be looked at. So, it was constantly moving from one to the other, you know, swinging from one to the other. So, one, one is called universalist perspective, one approach which was given more emphasis. It is not that they do not agree on other part of it, but the major focus was on universalist perspective. One group of researchers who are stressing the evolutionary origin of emotions, viewing them as biologically given and invariant. So, according to them, some of these emotions are universal and they are evolutionary in nature and you know they are biologically hardware in our system. So, that was the idea of universalist perspective of emotion. Another school of thought was social constructionist perspective or theories. Their uh, focus was uh, more on they stressed the nurture part of it means environmental part of it, cultural part of it. Uh, the focusing on the cultural processes that shape emotions and assume that emotions differed between cultures. So, they are focusing more on uh, how cultural processes shape emotions, influences emotions and uh, one of the assumption was that you know 
a lot of these influences will have differential influences of culture will have will have implications and uh, the different culture will experience emotion uh, you know or express emotions differently as per the cultural uh, norms and so on so these are the two uh, major uh, perspective where no people have been kind of swinging from one to the other and the researchers were going from this side to that side and so on so if i just uh, you know kind of show it like this so the major perspectives in the context of culture and emotion so one is as we said is uh, universalist perspective and another is social constructionist perspective so here the idea is the emotions are evolutionary biologically given and invariant across cultures social construction is perspective they say cultural processes shape emotions and varies across culture so these are the two uh, perspectives uh, that uh, are majorly you know found in the research researches some of the people are more towards universalist perspective some people are more oriented towards co social constructionist perspective as you see the both the perspectives have very different kind of assumptions and accordingly their researches are shaped so our whole purpose will be you know in this module uh, we will be talking about both the perspectives the pros and cons and kind of arguments and the evidences associated with each of this perspective so in today's lecture we'll be talking and looking deeper into the universalist perspective and in the next lecture we'll be talking about uh, primarily the social constructionist perspective of emotions so this is how we'll go and both the perspective basically we'll look in deeper uh, ways and uh, we'll then conclude which one is better and uh, and how to kind of understand both of both these perspectives so we'll be as we will focus will be focusing more on universalist perspective in today's lecture so the question is are there universal emotions now researcher which are who are sub subscribing to the universalist perspective of emotions believe that uh, this is their fundamental assumptions or believe that you know regardless of culture in which one lives certain emotions are called as basic emotions are experienced by everyone so this is the fundamental assumptions or belief or kind of perspective of the universalist uh, you know universalist uh, researcher researcher in the tradition of universalist research or perspective so the thing is that you know regardless of culture some emotions like basic emotions are experienced by everyone in every culture so these are like you know universal so this is the assumption so the underlying assumption is that basic emotion evolved for their adaptive utility because these emotions evolved from the animals because and they are passed on because of their adaptive utility you know 
and they are essential for coping with life activities. So that is why they are necessary for every human being. So they evolve across cultures. So they are, that is why they are universal. Anger, for example, protects us from exploitation. So anger as an emotion have helped us to survive, to protect us, to defend us. This emotion has kind of, you know, uh, because it is the anger that kind of helps you to protect yourself or the fight with the enemy and so on. So it, it, it has an evolutionary and adaptive purpose to it. So this will be experienced by people in every culture. So this is the assumptions of universalist perspective. So the most basic emotional theories, most of them we have discussed in some of the earlier lecture, uh, assume that each basic emotion relate to certain adaptive value as we have discussed and each of these basic emotion has their own set of distinct characteristics. So, they can be kind of identified or distinguished from one another because they have distinctive unique characteristics like what events will cause them, what kind of facial expression they will have, they will have different facial expressions, they will have different have vocal expression, they will have different physiological indicators and so on. So, the experience of each of these basic emotions are not directly measurable. Obviously, the experience can only be you know this is something that the person experiences within themselves. In research, measurement mostly focuses on the characteristics feature associated with them. So, for example, uh, when we experience a emotion, there will be physiological changes, there will be changes in the expressive behavior and this thing can be measured. So, most of the researches have been focusing on this associated changes that happens, they try to measure and kind of make sense out of them. <coughs> Cross cultural study aimed at providing the universality of basic emotion relied on observable features of basic emotions. You know, they are mostly focusing on whatever observable features of best emotional experiences are such as facial and vocal expression physiological responses patterns associated with these basic emotions. So, these things we will now look into deeper more more deeper into these aspects and how what kind of evidences are there in the researches particularly in the context of universalist idea. So, are there universal facial expression across cultures? So, that is the thing that we will be looking now. So, if you look at uh, one of the earliest work in uh, Im emotion, particularly the concept of basic universal emotion was Charles Darwin's work. We have already discussed in the historical perspective. Uh, in his book, Expression of Emotions in Man and Animal in 1872 that was published, he argued that emotional expression most likely arose because they provided some survival and reproductive advantage to individuals. So, some adaptive value was there, some evolutionary function was there. So, that uh, that was one of the main reason why emotion evolved. So, animal for example, that responds to danger by making themselves appear larger have a better chance of survival since the change in appearance may deter the attacker. So, like this you know in animals and also in anim humans some emotions could have advantages. Uh, that is why they are passed on from generation to generation. <coughs> so, uh, Darwin was one of the first person who looked at facial expression across cultures, you know. Uh, in that time, whatever methodology he could do, whatever the evidences he could find out, because it was difficult, you know, traveling was very uh, expensive and it was not possible to travel like today's world. So, so he tried to, even within those limitations, try to understand facial expression in different cultures. Darwin realized that if facial expressions were inherited from primates, means inherited from the animals, they should be similar throughout all human cultures. If something is inherited to a species, it should be same across all people. So, that was his evolutionary idea. What he did? He used recorded accounts from missionaries and others who had visited other countries, because at that time, you know, missionaries organizations were kind of traveling into different parts of the countries to educate them and so on. And Darwin put his theory to test. He tried to test this assumption that whether people express emotions similarly in different countries and cultures. At that time, photography was also very rare and expensive that very rarely you know it, those technologies were not there or it was there very rudimentary forms. 
So, Darwin sent letters to anyone he knew who are staying in other, other countries residing abroad uh, and asked them to describe normal facial expression of various emotions, how people in those countries express emotions normally, different emotions. Uh, and inquiring as to whether people in those culture exhibited those emotions similarly, whether they are expressing those emotions very similar to the, their countries or are there any differences. So, he was kind of writing letters to those people whom he knew were staying abroad and asking them in those countries how people express emotion. So, he was trying to understand is it same across culture, countries and cultures or different. So, according to Darwin's correspondence, uh, people whatever he could gather from those correspondences, he found people across the world exhibited lot of wide range of emotion in a similar way. This is what from the correspondence he found. For example, some of the things that he found that you know they open their jaws occasionally as well as their wide open eyes when startled or amazed. For example, whenever somebody experiences startled or amazed or surprised emotion, they open their jaws as well as their they make their eye no, wide open eyes. So, this was associated with amaze, startles or kind of surprise kind of emotion. They squint their faces when perplexed or puzzled. People cover their faces when humiliated by using their hands. So, these are some of the evidences he could gather which he found were very similar to their own culture, people from all the different countries, they express these emotions very similarly. So, this was kind of uh, found, uh, the result he found. These facial expressions are displayed, at, you know, he interestingly found also that these facial expressions are displayed by some people who were born blind and deaf. So, which is very interesting because if somebody is born blind and deaf, he could not mimic other by looking at others expression of emotion you know when we see others we learn by looking at others but if you are blind from birth you have not seen any other people expressing those emotion even people who are blind and or deaf from birth these people also displayed uh, you know this facial expression which is astonishing given that they never knew what it feels like to be seen or you know or see something so, that means, this is something very biologically hardware thing. So, this is what he found. About a century later, you know, some other uh, another Austrian biologist, uh, another Austrian biologist, uh, it is very difficult to pronounce his name, Iranias uh, Ibel Ibestfeld is the name of the researcher. Uh, he visited numerous remote cultures and took pictures because at that time at least photography was possible of people's facial expression you know from diverse culture. He also found uh, at least you know kind of from his account he also noted uh, striking cross cultural similarities in the facial expression of emotion. Most of these emotions are very similarly expressed by people in the different culture. In the early 20th century, dominant social sciences theories emphasize substantial environment effect. Early 20th century, some people started focusing on those, you know, cultural, uh, the role of culture in shaping emotion, those social constructionist perspective slowly started coming in and uh, they also, uh, you know, emphasize environmental effect more than the universal perspective. Uh, in the mid 20th century, lot of ethnographic ac accounts of cultural disparities, you know, in expression. They also looked at some of these things. We will be discussing them little bit more detail in the next lecture. So, some of this also started coming in from the early uh, 20th century to the mid 20th century. Some social constructionist researcher also came into the picture. However, in 1960s, uh, this whole universalist perspective also became, you know, the momentum again started by the research of Paul Ekman, Carol Izzard and some other you know basic emotional theorist uh, who went out to test Darwin's hypothesis that you know if something is evolutionary adaptive, uh, something is biologically driven, it should be same, same across cultures. So, they tried to test it in the modern world with more evidences uh, of the Darwin's uh, hypothesis. 
So, the, so according to their hypothesis, the people uh, or Darwin's hypothesis was that you know, diverse culture should agree on the meaning of few basic facial expression, if not all emotions, at least some basic emotions. So, they use photographs uh, from Tompkins, Sylvan Tompkins is another prominent researcher of basic emotional model. Uh, the, their collection of facial expression of basic emotions in their research. So, this was the kind of photographs they used uh, of uh, from the Tompkins uh, collection. So, these are the six basic emotions uh, happiness, surprise, fear, anger, disgust, sadness and so on. So, these are the six basic photographs that was kind of used in their research. What they did was you know they showed these photographs of people expressing this basic emotion such as anger, disgust, fear, happiness, sadness and surprise and ask participant to identify the emotions in the photograph and ask people from the different cultures to identify those emotions. Several versions of these studies have been undertaken, not one study, many, many versions of these studies have been undertaken in nations all over the world. So, to include people from diverse culture. They even included some participants in some studies who resided in small secluded rural communities where they rarely encountered people from the western world and not even watched television and movies. So, they are not exposed to the modern world, even remote native people you know, who are not exposed to any of this modern uh, media and uh, whatever. You know. So, what happens when you even, even one some people some communities may live very remotely, but if they are exposed to medias they may know how people from other cultures react and so on. So, that can influence their you know judgment, but if people are very secluded and not, not exposed to those you know different medias, then you can understand you know this is a pure emotion experience by those uh, particular communities. So, that is why it was needed to take people from you know such communities uh, or native people who are not exposed to this western cultures and so on. So, a lot of versions of these studies have been undertaken uh, where from the different countries of the world including uh, people uh, in from the small secluded rural communities uh, who generally have not encountered western world. Now, most of these studies result reveal that majority of this individual across different cultures interpret specific emotional experience very similarly. These basic emotions they could they could identify across cultures including those secluded people uh, in different cultures. So, that is one of the uh, kind of evidence they found which also kind of shows that at least some basic emotions are universal in that sense. However, they also noted that to certain degree individuals tend to have a greater proficiency in recognizing expression from their own ethnic group compared to those of other groups. They also found that this is a very subtle understanding or finding that you know people uh, when they are exposed to the expression of emotion from their own cultural group, they are much more better in identifying them as compared to if people from other culture expresses those emotion, even though they could identify, but their identification was much better when it was photography or expression was from the people from their own culture, uh, own ethnic group. So, in that sense some cultural biasness is there that you know they are much better because you know they are more familiar with their own cultural, but still they could I'd, I'd understand expression from other cultures. This is one of the kind of you know. Uh, uh, Russell uh, in 1994 kind of uh, did an uh, you know kind of uh, pairing of from across lot of these studies. Uh, they found how western and non-western people, uh, people from non-western cultures, how they are, what is the accuracy of matching those uh, emotions or identifying those emotions from the photographs and other things. So, this uh, graph shows that. So, this was taken from the Russell 1994 st uh, study which shows the average across many studies. So, this is the result from many studies averages are taken not just one study F almost included 2000 people in the sample. So, if you see all this emotion happiness, surprise, sadness, fear, disgust and anger uh, mean accuracies you can see almost uh, western and non western people very similar kind of uh, you know accuracies were there obviously, the western had little 
higher accuracies. Uh, but people from other culture also had almost very similar comparable uh, accuracies. However, this studies or people also pointed out uh, some possible limitations were also there in the studies including Darwin's research which was obviously you know as it was much earlier. So, it was he was he did whatever was possible at that time. Uh, some people also kind of criticize in that sense that the images that were used in these studies were very extreme strong representations. Know, strong representation of each of these emotions in terms of facial expressions were used in the studies. So, that is why the accuracy was very high because people could understand those uh, expression because these are very strongly expressed tend to increase with these pictures. So, uh, maybe in real life not all the time people use such strong expressions. So, in that sense people also has some reservations that it may be high accuracies may be re reported because of this such strong depiction in the pictures. Some people even criticize some of the procedures, so we will not go into detail of that. Uh, so, measuring people's accuracy at identifying facial expression is difficult as the results vary depending on the procedural details. So, as the procedure of the experiment changes, so the accuracy how you measure that accuracy also keeps changing. So, kind of sometimes comparing could be misleading in some of this context. So, these are some of the criticism of those studies that obviously, no study is perfect, uh, some limitations are there. However, uh, it is clear that various facial expression conveys essentially same meaning from culture to culture. At least this is very clear, a uh, lot of these studies at least indicate that meaning was kind of very similar uh, sub for some of these basic emotions across cultures. Many scientists view this finding as at least it is, it is giving some proof that human have a few, few at least universal emotions or certain templates of uh, emotions uh, for generating and interpreting certain facial expressions. So, at least it gives some evidence to the universal um, presence of some emotion, particularly some of the basic emotion across cultures. So, uh, so this, is, this is about facial expression and some evidence to it. Now, we will talk about are there uh, universal vocal expressions is or um, so do people from different culture uh, when they express emotion in their vocal or when they say something in the vocalization part of it is it also universally same or are there differences in it. So, let us see some of the research evidences. So, research on vocal expression of uh, emotion are less compared obviously vocal expression the researches are less as compared to most of the studies is focused on facial expression because it was uh, more easier to do uh, in, in terms of you know, collection of data and so on. Vocal expression researches are there, but comparatively less because of difficulty in finding real life record of vocal expression of specific emotions. Few studies on vocal expression of emotion has uh, also led to some support to cross cultural similarity in expression. Some evidences are there. So, let us see some of these evidences. So, this is one of the study done in 2001 uh, by Scherer and colleagues. Uh, they uh, did a study on vocal emotional portraits of anger, sadness, fear, joy and some neutral voices delivered by some professional actors. In nine countries across Europe, United States and Asia. So, this was this was, this was the study, it is a large scale study, uh, where certain actors portrayed those emotion in their voice and uh, the typical basic emotions, anger, sadness, fear, joy and some neutral voices. And uh, this was, uh, these samples were used across nine countries of Europe, United States and Asia. So, different cultures, different countries. Okay? The goal or the purpose of this study was to test the hypothesis that vo vocal expression of emotions may be reliably recognized by members of other cultures. So, the idea is uh, these vocal expressions should be if they are universal should be identified by people from all these countries okay? if we consider them as a universal. You know? So, that was the hypothesis. Now, the research, the result of the research shows that uh, overall accuracy across different countries were around 66 percent, 
which is good in some sense uh, because uh, it is at least above 50 percent although accuracy was better than chance. So, 66 percent means it is not because of chance at least some reliability is there. Uh, there were significant variances from 74 percent in German. So, some country 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 to country certain variations were there 74 percent in Germany to 52 percent in Indonesia. So, in some countries this accuracy was much higher Germany because the actors themselves were from Germany. So, probably it was much higher and it was much less 52 percent in Indonesia. Okay. So, there was a differences across countries also. The result also shows the patterns of confusion were uh, remarkably similar across all countries. Um, the confusions, the problems that um, arose in different countries were also very similar. So, this finding at least implies that similar inferences rules from vocal expression ag exist across culture. At least some evidences this shows that you know certain similarities in understanding and the expression of vocal expression was there across culture, although it was not like 100 percent or something like that. Bryant and Barrett uh, in 2008 also uh, they did a study try in order to examine the perception of vocal emotional expression across culture with. Uh, but they focused on a culture who had very little exposure to the you know uh, sources of emotional stimuli such as mass media. So, uh, they also did a study, but th this time they studied only cultures who are very exclusive remote cultures where they had very little exposure to mass media and understanding of uh, other world uh, other countries. So, it was kind of uh, sure hunter horticulturist Amazonian equator. So, this is a kind of native tribe uh, in Amazonian uh, equator uh, and uh, these people they hit the, you know this researcher tried to examine the perception of vocal emotional expression. So, the researcher uh, he found that you know th these people also could identify happy angry happy angry fearful and sad vocalization produced by American native English speakers. So, American native English speaker when they kind of expressed this emotion in their vocab voice using some sentences by matching emotional spoken utterances of emotional expression depicted in the picture of uh, in the pictured in uh, depicted in pictured faces. So, it was like you know they had to match this certain faces or pictures depicting certain emotions and the voices expressing certain emotions that they have to match whether this picture expressing emotion is similar to the emotion expressed in the voice. So, that matching exercise was there and uh, they could see that these people also uh, could identify some of these basic emotions in the vocalization. These people also perform similar almost similar to English speakers who heard the same phrases while they are content filtered almost similarly. So, this finding at least support the concept that vocal emotional response of basic affective categories occur in comparable ways across culture at least uh, this provides some evidence that you know some of these basic emotions um, the way they are vocalized uh, are comparable across cultures. In another experiment Sauter and her and colleagues um, in 2009 also explore an, uh, in another study the recognition of non verbal emotional vocalization like screams and laughs in two distinct cultures. So, non verbal emotional vocalization here or no, you are not speaking any sentences or anything, uh, but certain vocalization where there is no words like screams and laughs that also co communicate certain emotions. So, in this study they were trying to understand whether people can recognize those non-verbal vocalization in different cultures. So, individual from rural culturally isolated Namibian settlement again very isolated uh, communities were used and compared with the western participants. So, here the procedure was something like this a participant listened to a short emotional story. So, a short emotional story was you know told to the participant portraying an event that triggers an emotion. So, basically that short story 
had an emotional event such as person being very upset because of close relative has died. So, some death of some person and the associated emotions were there in those stories. Now, there were played two vocalization sound after confirming that, that this, this participant comprehended the intended emotion of the story. So, the researcher made sure that they understood this story and the emotions behind it and then two vocalization sounds were made not sentences sounds were made or played basically it was recorded earlier by some professionals and uh, they were asked one of this sound was similar to the emotion of the story and one was not. So, the participant had to match which one is similar to the story's emotion. One of the similar was similar to the emotion describing the story while the other was a distraction, other was something else. So, the participant were asked to choose which of the two vocalization best represented the emotion of the story. If the emotion of the story was sadness and one of the vocalization that was played was sad vocalization, another was some other emotion. So, they had to match which one match with the story. So, that was the task. English sounds from uh, were from uh, previously validated set of non-verbal vocalization of emotion which validated some sets of emotions uh, vocalizations were already there. So, they took those vocalization produced by two male and two female British speaking uh, English speaking adults. Himba sound means sounds from those Namibia's uh, their native language also produced by five male and six female Himba adults from their communities and were selected in an equivalent way to English stimuli. So, from both the cultures people produce those sounds. So, in that study they found that vocalization related to those some of these basic emotions or fundamental emotions like anger, uh, you know anger, uh, disgust, fear, joy, sadness and surprise were detected in both the cultures okay, bi directionally when uh, the speakers were from that community that is that himba uh, uh, this was uh, you know this was kind of himba sounds himba language speaking people when they did western people could identify by direction means when western people made those sound those uh, native people could identify so by directionally they could identify those uh, basic emotions. In contrast, a set of additional emotion was only identified inside the cultural bound, not across them. However, beyond those uh, basic emotions, some other emotional uh, sounds that were produced were not really identified by people from other cultures. So, if it was produced by western uh, uh, person, it was not identified by the this na native people. When it was uh, native people produce those emotion, uh, western people could not identify. So, the, that kind of identification was much less. It was only identified by within those cultural boundaries when it was produced by you know people from their own culture, not across them. So, findings show that a number of mostly uh, also showed that negative emotions vocalizations were recognized much better way across culture whereas majority of the positive emotions are expressed using culture specific signals. So, the identification was much more stronger in the negative emotions vocalization particularly they could identify the vocalization of negative emotions a much better way across cultures. However, similarity similar was not there in case of positive emotions. In positive emotion the people could identify more from their culture specific signals. So, this was uh, some of the evidences of vocalization across cultures. There are obviously some evidences, but uh, it was not like perfect match. So, let us see what are the significant observation we get from these studies and, some, and many other studies also. These are only some uh, significant studies uh, I have discussed. There are other studies also. So, what is the what are the significant observations from these uh, studies? One thing is that facial and vocal recognition experiment I am now taking both face and vocal recognition experiments across cultures reveal that some cross cultural similarity is there for the basic emotions. For basic emotions there are people from across culture identified at least some of these basic emotions. So, there are some cross cultural validity is there. However, there are cultural differences also observed as well as because the accuracy was not 100 percent same in across cultures. So, some cultural variation was also there. People from all cultures 
correctly identified some facial and vocal emotions above chance, some of these basic emotions, but the percentages of correct identification varied greatly from 20 to 95 percent from study to study based on both culture and emotion. Okay. So, so, both the aspects were there, cultures correctly, uh, some of the facial and vocal expressions were above chance you know, identified for particularly for the basic emotions. However, this identification and the you know accuracy of those identification varied from study to study. In some, it was from 20 and some in some cases even 95 percent. So, it was not like 100 percent agreement in all these studies. So, there was also evidences of in group advantage means within cultural advantage, which means that person from the same culture were always better at recognizing face facial expression. So, it is always that you know people could identify the expressions facial or the vocal from their own culture much better than outside. So, that was also observed in group advantage means this. Perceiver who had been exposed to the sender's culture or whose culture was similar to the sender culture also perform better. So, when a person is exposed to a particular culture or they had you know similarity to the other culture, then the accuracy also increased. So, that was also kind of in group advantage uh, that was also seen in lot of these studies. Now, come to the physiological aspect of emotion. Are there any evidence of universal physiological impact of emotion? Is it like same across culture or there are differences? Now, this is another area where some researches were done. So, do people in different culture show similar physiological response in response to same emotional experience? That means, when somebody is fear fearful, the kind of physiological changes that happens like heartbeat increase and so on, is it same across all cultures or there are differences? Some researches uh, try to address this, let us see. So, Levinson, Ekman and uh, Fryson in 1990, they also conducted a, one of the first studies involving uh, American university student where they tried to measure physiological aspect of emotion. So, the participant in the study displayed diverse pattern of autonomic nervous system reactivity when they arranged their faces into displays of distinct emotional facial expression. So, here the, the case was like you know the students were asked to display certain specific emotions in their face and then physiological measures were recorded in response to those emotional expression. So, the idea was when uh, they smile kind of what physiological changes happens when they ang are angry facial expression what physiological changes happens uh, in terms of autonomic nervous system and others. While they smiled with joy for example, they showed a distinct pattern of heart rate, skin conduction. So, all these distinct patterns were noted in detail skin conductance, heart rate, finger warmth, muscular activity and so on. Now, this same study was uh, repeated several years later in Indonesia. So, the data from western uh, people, American uh, participants was already there. So, the same study was done in another culture in Indonesia, in another stand country, uh, Minangkabau men and from western Sumatra uh, as participants from Indonesia to test whether this was also same in the people with the in Indonesia also. So, the, the similar method was applied here also, experimenter guided muscular contraction approach was employed once more to elicit recognizable facial expression of emotion. Similar methodology was applied and they measured some of the parameters like heart rate, finger temperature, skin conductance, finger pulse, transmission time, finger pulse amplitude. So, on diverse measures of physiological parameters were noted down. The physiological response of uh, these samples uh, were very similar uh, to the Americans that was done earlier. Uh, only two physiological parameters differed, but most of the physiological parameters were same. So, this shows almost some cross cultural similarity in the physiology of emotion, uh, at least in these two cultures it was shown. In another study, you know. Sai and Levinson investigated some physiological similarity between East Asia and European American couples during emotional state. So, again the couples from East Asia and 
European Americans were you know uh, were included as study uh, participants. So, here are the how it was done uh, the couples engaged in baseline neutral talk they were just neutrally talking. So, that was and their physiological sub parameters were measured as a baseline measure. So, no, no normal nu neutral talking nothing emotional was there. In the laboratory when the, they are talking physiological uh, monitoring with the equipment were done. Then after some time the follow it, it was followed by discussion of strongest area of conflict. So, emotion was induced how it was induced they were asked to discuss conflicts in their relationship. So, that is emotion laden discussion. So, during the conversation self report as well as physiological measures of emotions were evaluated through instruments physiological measures were constantly monitored and their own self report was also taken. Uh, the result shows that while conflict conversation was obviously substantially more emotional which is commonsensical it should be emotional then the baseline discussion which was neutral discussion as shown in both the measures. They were interestingly found physiological changes did not differ by national group. In fact, self report of emotions also did not differ significantly. Interestingly for both means, means for the people from different cultures it was very similar measurement came out while they were. Uh, in uh, no included uh, when, wh while they were engaged in you know emotional discussion you know self report was also very similar so this also indicates some cross cultural similarity in terms of physiological measures um, obviously uh, for every study there will be some limitation no study is perfect some uh, argument some criticisms are there for these studies also for example, you know it is unclear what cross cultural similarity in physiological response means. So, physiological response first of all it is even not clear for most of the emotions. So, then comparing with the other cultures may not make much sense according to some people given that uh, many uh, meta analysis or research showed uh, no distinct physiological response in associated with the emotions. So, uh, but at least it shows that the response patterns are very similar across culture uh, even though we can say that some of the emotions the evidence there is a lack of evidence of specific physiological response to all these basic emotions. So, we can say evidences are kind of there are evidences, but it may not be very strong uh, some of these evidences overall you can say some weak evidences are there which indicate some similarity in some cultures more studies probably would be required in this area. Now, so most of these studies if you see whatever we have discussed till now are about seeing whether the particular emotions basic emotions or some emotions are similarly experienced or expressed across culture. So, the emotions focus was given to the emotions particular emotions are there in every in, in different cultures. Now, is another group of researcher or another kind of perspective is taken by some researcher where they rather than looking at emotion themselves they are seeing at what component of emotion could be universal rather than looking at which emotions are universally there is it is also possible that some component of emotions are there universal and some component are not there. So, this is called as componential theory of emotion. So, some researcher have shifted away to this perspective and uh, uh, from the theory of universal emotion uh, and moving towards focusing on the features of component of emotion that are same across culture. So, it is possible that some aspects of emotions could be universal and some uh, may not be universal because evidences are not perfect. So, this uh, theorist looks at uh, the component part of emotion let us see what they are looking at. So, the componential theory is another school of thought that focuses on the components of emotional experience. When we experience this emotion there are different components to it. So, according to this theory emotional experience can be examined in terms of more fundamental and universal emotional component. The link between these components and emotional experience is universal. Uh, when the same set of components occur across culture the same emotional experiences arise. So, component means what leads to certain emotion let us say it could be one component when you feel joy what causes joy. So, this is 
one component associated with the emotions. When this component is present, the emotion will arise. You know? So, this is the link between one component to the other component. Uh, there could be other components associated with. So, like this rather than just looking at emotion itself, there could be many factors associated with those emotions. So, those are called as components. So, is it like those components are universal or not? Let us, uh, so that was the focus. So, lot of uh, cross cultural research in this area is concentrated on particularly two components of emotion. One is called as appraisals, another is called action readiness. So, let us see what are these two components. So, these two components basically when we are saying that means these are associated with every emotions. There will be an appraisal aspect to emotions, there will be an action readiness aspects to the emotions, every emotion. So, this is these are components, parts, aspects of emotion, every emotion will be associated with them. So, rather than looking at emotion itself, now the, they are focusing whether these components are universal or not. So, that was the differences in the approach from the earlier studies. So, appraisal basically means we have already talked about it basically it means how you assess or interpret a situation because, because the cognitive theories of emotion if you look at whatever we have discussed they focus on appraisals. They say the appraisal is the primary component first you judge a situation and then emotion arises and physiological uh, changes tr are triggered. So, when you see a situation you judge it is is it a dangerous situation, it is a neutral situation or it is a happy situation or positive situation, negative situation. You judge first then emotion happens accordingly. So, if you judge that this is a dangerous situation fear will arise. So, this interpretation is called appraisal. So, the assessment and meaning and relevance of a particular situation of the individual and it is typically represented a pattern of outcomes on several dimensions. So, um, uh, appraisal could be positive, it could be negative, what is it could be based on harmful etcetera etcetera and so on. So, all this interpretation that we do of a situation is called appraisal and every emotion is triggered by those interpretation. Based on interpretation, whatever kind of interpretation you will do accordingly emotion will happen. Action readiness on the other hand is about behavioral component of the uh, emotion which basically means whenever we experience an emotion uh, there will be some behavioral part of motivational part to it which will which will kind of propel a person to move in certain direction. So, when you are fearful you may try to run away when you are joyful probably you will kind of expand and try to participate in something or like this you know. So, there is a tendency to action associated with different emotions. So, that is called action readiness. So, it basically uh, refers to the motivated goal in the situation and is typically express the desire to act in a particular way. So, uh, whenever we experience an emotion there is a tendency also associated with it to act in certain ways you either to move away, move against whatever it is or act aggressively uh, etcetera. So, all these action tendencies will be associated with the emotion. So, every emotion will have some action tendencies, every emotion will have some appraisal part to it. So, these are components of emotion not the emotion themselves, these are kind of triggers or associated aspects of emotions. So, some researchers you know uh, try to see whether these are universal or not, every, the emotion so every emotion will have this component whether these are similar across culture or not. So, that was the main idea in componential theory of emotion. So, are there evidences of similarity of appraisal of emotion? Is it like when we experience happiness or joy, the appraisal is similar across all, all cultures, when similarly we judge a situation then only the happiness or joy arises or when we experience fear the appraisal is very similar of the situation. So, let us see the evidences. So, again uh, uh, Scherer has uh, done a uh, cross cultural study to explore whether a particular emotion is associated with the same appraisal in different cultures. So, that was the focus. So, this participant uh, took data from 37 nations. So, it is a very large scale study of 5 continents. 37 nations on 5 continents were asked to recall a time when they felt each of the following emotions. So, the participant were asked recall a time when you experience joy when you experienced anger. So, it was done obviously uh, step by step. 
then they were asked for each emotion there are certain other questions fear sadness disgust shame and guilt so these emotions were used as a kind of to see whether uh, you know uh, appraisal part of it is associated similarly in across culture so 37 countries from five continents so it's a very large scale study and it means something so that was the participants were asked to remember a time when they experienced this emotion and then they were asked to describe a situation in which they felt this emotion and they were asked to describe when you felt this emotion what was the situation in what situation you have experienced this emotion and rate this situation and then you judge this situation on these dimensions so these are all appraisal dimensions how do you judge a situation is it a novel expected situation unexpected situation it is a is it a pleasant situation or unpleasant situation is it a goal conducive situation or not is it a fair situation or unfair situation uh, who was responsible in that situation is it self or someone else what kind of coping you have done how much control the participant felt in that situation it was totally out of your control or you had a control of the situation was there any moral aspect associated with for example many times we may feel shame and guilt when morality is associated you know you did something immoral so shame and guilt may happen was the situation uh, has a moral aspect whether or it had a moral aspect or not was it relevant to your self concept and so on so all these are all appraisal dimension how do you judge a situation you can judge a situation using all these dimensions so they are particularly looking at judgment of the situation on these dimensions appraisal part of it so these are all appraisals So, they were asked to remem uh, remember a situation when they felt these basic emotions and then they were asked what was the situation where you experienced this situation, what was the situation when you felt very joyful last time or whatever it is. Then you see just this situation, what was the nature of that situation, was it very novel or new situation or, or was it an expected situation like this, all these questions were asked to understand different appraisals. The researcher then investigated whether the participant all throughout the world they judge this, di this appraisal dimensions was similar or not. When somebody felt joyful, the situational interpretation was same or not, that was the uh, objective. So, the result was shown in some of these diag figures, you can see some of these graphs. So, if you see these different lines, these are different lines form different nations. So, this is for joy. Okay. So, this these are all appraisal dimension if you see these are all appraisal dimensions. Okay. So, if you see joy it was very similar every nation had talked about it uh, that it was uh, you know expectedness was kind of you know high unpleasantness was very low. Um, goal obstruction, unfairness, you know, external causation, coping ability, immorality, self consistency. If you see all these appraisals were similarly done, when persons experience joy or happiness, people from all the cultures of in this particular study reported the situation, the, the nature of the situation was very similar for all of them, which triggered joy this is for joy for other emotions the agreement was not that high for shame it was different for different countries um, pattern was very uh, almost similar in some cases but there were differences you can see D different lines represent different nations or different countries anger was also kind of similar but there are some differences guilt again it was for guilt it is for anger this one is for shame it was not like joy where it was very similar, but uh, there are differences here, uh, but similarities are also there. S for sadness, you can see here, for disgust, for fear, so here pattern is also kind of very similar. So, this was the result uh, they found. 
So, what was the takeaway of this experiment? Overall, this study demonstrated that certain appraisal patterns are related to the same emotion across. So, certain appraisals were very similarly done, like in case of joy. The commonalities between regions were far greater than the differences in the appraisal pattern best match a given situation. Differences were there, but commonalities was kind of higher at the higher side. People for example, reported uh, being joyful in response to event, which event led to joyful experiences. It was very similarly explained by every people from every culture. So, it was mostly in a situation which was somewhat expected, very pleasant situation consistent with their goals, certain goals they wanted to achieve and it was achieved. It was a fair situation and made them feel good about themselves. So, this was the appraisal of the situation that led to joy and it was similar across cultures. Although the overall pattern of similarity in appraisal across culture was impressive, it is equally noteworthy to see there are cultural variations also because other diagram you can see it was not exactly matching. So, some differences were also there. So, in terms of dimension, people differ, uh, uh, people from different cultures frequently disagreed regarding the role of morality in the evaluation of emotional experience. That morality dimension that was there in the appraisal, whether the situation is moral, immoral and uh, whether you feel joyful or shame when it is moral, immoral. So, there are a lot of cultural variations was there in the dimensions of morality. What is considered as moral, what is considered as immoral was kind of very different interpretation in different cultures. So, there are lot of differences were found. Situation pro producing the most pleasant feelings were regarded as highly immorally by African participant. So, for example, you can see the differences in African participants, pleasant feelings were kind of regarded as highly immoral, the situation that created. But more morally acceptable by Latin American participant with people from other regions falling somewhere in between or in the middle. But these were extremely extreme, one extreme was African participant, another uh, was a Latin American participant in terms of moral dimension, situation you know, uh, producing uh, unpleasant feelings were regarded as highly immoral by African and not, but more morally acceptable by Latin American, other participants were somewhere in the middle. Compared to this, participant gave nearly identical rating on coping ability dimensions. So, which uh, situation uh, the coping ability to ability to deal with the situation uh, for each emotional situation, uh, it was very similar in all the cultures. So, perception of what is and what is not moral was very different in different cultures. So, this is an area where a lot of differences were observed. So, finding of this study imply that similar to facial expressions, this is we have seen in the facial expression, most of the world displays appraisal profiles that are very similar appraisal profile was there, uh, especially associated with some distinct emotions. Similar to facial expression, cross cultural agreement is not perfect, every, everybody did not agree on everything some there are some agreement, some disagreement. So, individuals from other culture tend to agree more strongly on some aspect of appraisal than others. So, the patterns of results are very similar across different expression of emotion like facial expression, voice, voice expression, even you know, in this case of appraisal also. Uh, there are similarities, but there are dissimilarities also. Now, are there any cross cultural similarity in the action readiness, the another component of emotion that we talked about that every emotion is associated with some action tendencies, either you want to move towards, move against, some movement will happen with all emotions. So, is it like ev the emotional movement tendencies are same across culture or it is different? So, that was also, but very few studies are actually available on uh, action tendencies. There are some evidence suggests that some core action readiness dimensions such as moving away, moving towards, moving against the object of emotions is able to discriminate among emotions. Okay. So, this action tendencies typically include uh, <coughs> moving away, for example, maybe when you are uh, afraid we want to move away, moving towards and moving against probably you know during anger and so on. 
uh, you want to move against something. So, this dimension reflects action readiness aspect of it, whether it could uh, are this similar for all emotions across culture. Not much empirical evidences are available in this direction, but uh, some cross cultural studies uh, show that shame has been associated with urge to disappear. Whenever people experience shame, it is associated with we want to disappear from the situation, you know, it is very similar across cultures. Whenever you experience shame, you want to run away from that situation, you want to disappear, you know, that is action tendency associated with this emotion, it is very similar across culture. Not much evidences are available. Uh, large scale studies are at least uh, I could not find much in this direction. So, again here you know some evidences could be there, uh, some evidences at least show some emotions action tendencies could be very similar. However, more research is necessary to make any conclusion in this direction. So, studies suggest that there may be some similar pattern of appraisal and action readiness across cultures. Overall, uh, there are some evidences for cross cultural similarity in the expression of basic emotions. Uh, in every expression like facial expression or uh, you know uh, voice and so on. However, the cross cultural agreement is not perfect. In all the evidences it is clear there are some similarities for these basic emotions in terms of expression, in terms of appraisal, in terms of action readiness. But, uh, agreement is not perfect, some culture specific dimensions of expression of emotions are always there, have been reported in most of these studies. So, what are those cultural differences, how culture shape those differences, all this detail we will discuss in the next lecture. So, next lecture will particularly deal with, even though there are some similarities, why every studies found some cultural differences. So, next study we will look at the evidences of cultural differences and how culture shapes those differences why there are differences, how can we explain those differences. So, that will be the focus of the next lecture, where we will be dealing with the role of culture in shaping emotions. Okay. So, with this I will end today's lecture, thank you.